so my name is Anas Nashif. I work for Intel. Currently, I'm working on Zephyr. I've been working on Zephyr for the last four years. And today, I will start this presentation with some uh, thoughts and, and, and things that are happening right now in the Zephyr project, but trying to cover those in uh, general terms regarding functional safety and, and certification, something that we always want to do within the Zephyr project. Uh, but first, I will start with a disclaimer. I, I'm not a safety expert, yeah. So I actually <coughs> hope that the, at least the title of the presentation has attracted some safety experts here so I can, we can talk with you and we can, you can probably tell us if we are on the right path or not. Yeah, so I'm not a safety expert and I will be talking as a software engineer here and somebody who has involved, have been involved with the Zephyr project for a while. Uh, but I, am, I know enough that you should not be doing something like that. In a car, you can't just go do, you know, get a git clone or pip install, you know, and expect things to work. That's not how it works in this industry and in other industries. So we, at least I know that, uh, and most of you know that. Yeah? So, you know, today in cars, you can probably install a, an application on your console yeah, or something. I mean, there are all different things, but when it comes to functionality of the car, that's not something you, you want to do or your, your, your users to do. Yeah? So when it comes to open source software, this is, this is something new. I mean, it's happening right now. There's a lot of discussions. Uh, about open source and certifying uh, 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 open source stacks and open source code bases, uh, most prominently is the Linux kernel. Yeah? So there are a few projects out there, a few attempts to, to make uh, the, the, the Linux kernel uh, used in uh, safety critical applications. But there are also a lot of other projects used uh, in this context. So uh, the short answer is yes, and probably we don't know about it because the, the, you know, the, the amount of open source software out there is, is amazing, and there are so many things that you can do with open source software without actually going and, 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 and making announcements about it. So, I mean, my expectation and, and the way I see things, that open source is being used all the time, by commercial entities for commercial applications. And sometimes the owners or the authors of these projects don't even know about it. Yeah? So I mean, it depends on the license, of course. But uh, something that happens in the Zephyr project, we, we see a lot of people just pull the code, start developing products, and they don't even tell us what they are doing. Yeah? So the idea that open source uh, uh, can be used in this in the functional uh, safety context. Uh, I mean, my guess it is yes. A lot of people don't want to rewrite things, and they would just go and take something and adapt it to their environment. So they do a transformation behind closed doors mostly, and uh, obviously this is not what we want to see. But based on what I will be talking about a little bit later, that's is becoming a necessity yeah? because there are a lot of things uh, that are involved when you, when you try to certify or get a certain piece of code to, uh, to be safe, to be operated in, in vehicles, in aviation, in, in medical instruments, and so on. So mostly, I mean, what these open source projects, uh, to, to get to this level, uh, they need to deal with a lot of standards. And most of these standards were written with no, you know, without having open source in mind. Yeah, so just just a snapshot safety standards. A few of them there. There are probably more, depending on the industry. And every standard has its own variations and and so on. And there, there are really too many standards. And uh, most of these standards are quite old, have been there for a while, probably before open source even was as it is today. And uh, so there are quite a lot of them. And as, as Tanya Brown said, the nice thing about standards is there are so many 
of them to, to choose from. Yeah? And uh, so, I mean, looking at something like Zephyr, which is an Arthos, I will be talking about it a little bit more in details later. Uh, an example, is, is this even possible yeah, to, to get you know, uh, something uh, like an open source Arthos uh, with a small trusted code base uh, and, and uh, I'm showing the right slides, yeah, okay. With that small code base and uh, safety oriented architecture, uh, security, uh, POSIX, <coughs> depending on the application you want to uh, deploy on top of the Arthos, uh, deterministic threat scheduling, et cetera, et cetera. Is that, is that even possible? Yeah. And the question is, or the answer is, it, it, it's really not, the, open source is not really the limitation. The, 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 main, the main problem is really is that software, open source software usually is do, developed in a way which contradicts what uh, most of these safety standards expect. So most of you bro probably are familiar with the cathedral and, and the bazaar. Uh, uh, model. So it is, I mean, most of open source projects are developed based on the, or following the, the bazaar model. Uh, and when it comes to, uh, you know, to, to industry standards, they expect you to do something completely different, to follow a completely different model. The V model here in this case uh, require you to have specification of feature, comprehensive documentation, traceability, uh, you need to trust your contributors and, and know who your contributors are. And uh, the other problem is that, as I said earlier, mostly the certification authority will not be familiar or, or accustomed to, to this type of development. So this is, this is the V model here showing how things work and how things are, are expected to be developed in uh, when developing for safety critical applications. And probably some of you are familiar with the, with the model or concept of the different software development models, but I haven't seen many open source projects being developed using this model. Uh, uh, it, is, it is quite tricky. It, is, it requires a lot of process, a lot of documentation, and a lot of tools, and it's, it's not really straightforward. Uh, and but this is to, to get to to the level where you can actually uh, have your software even come close to what uh, the standards expect. You have actually to start transforming your uh, development model and your code base and and, and tools toward this this model or some similar model that allows you to you know to get the, the kind of traceability and and the connections and the gates. Uh, that are implemented in, in such model. But even before we go there into the software development model and, and, uh, and, and what the, the, the standards expect, quality is actually the, is the most important thing. Even, I mean, quality exists as a prerequisite before you even go into functional safety. And when I say quality here, it's, it's actually more than just my code has no bugs. It's, it's, about, it's about coverage, it's about it's about uh, documentation, about testing, test reports, and lots of other things that you see implemented and done in, in certain projects, mostly that are backed by commercial entities. But when you, when you write code as a hobby and, and, and put it on GitHub, nobody will hold you accountable if you don't have that, if the code works. I mean, you have contributors, they file bugs and so on, and you follow a very flexible and, and, and really, with, with that, I mean, you are really, nobody will hold you accountable or anything like that. Code is usually provided as is. And if you find a bug as a user, people will tell you, oh, file a bug or fix it yourself, contribute, yeah, and, and, and so on. Yeah. And this model kind of doesn't work if you actually want to go up the pyramid here. So the expectation from most of safety standards is actually to have a quality managed uh, 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 project or code base that uh, will help you get to the next steps. So as I said before, functional safety considers quality as an existing prerequisite, yeah? so a precondition. So you, 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 you can't even go to the next steps without that. 
So some, some examples of what is required there, I mean, at least for, for the quality managed uh, status or even to go further with, with certification or, or traceability, you need to be able to go and trace. First, you, have, you need to have requirements. And most, most, a, a lot of open source projects are developed you know, on bare need basis. Uh, I need this, I need that, so it happens sometimes somebody tells you on IRC, hey, how about this? And you go, oh, nice idea, you go implement it, and you know, within a few hours, probably you have this feature without any proper documentation, and probably even without testing. And that's, you know, usually works, but when it comes to, you know, to uh, going to the next level, you really need to document the whole process. You really need to, you know, to have the design and, and, and the requirements and the implementation and all the testing, functional unit, integration testing, all of that. And, and you need to have the dots connecting. Yeah? So you really need to, so every single line of code has, has, to, be, has to be connected. And this is like a commercial tool, LDRA, that actually shows you an example of how is this done. Yeah? So you can go all the way from you know, a, a, an implement or a requirement to the implementation, to the test, to the test reports. And you really need to show evidence that every line of code that you have in your, in your code base, in your project, is well tested, is well documented, it's based on a requirement that goes back to a customer or a user. And that's something we don't do in open source projects usually. This tool is, 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 I have seen that demonstrated to me a few years back and it's, it's amazing what they can do there. And I don't think anybody developing stuff on GitHub would be able to afford this. This is very expensive stuff uh, happening here. It's, 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 uh, uh, mostly it is used for commercial application by people who can afford that. And it's, uh, but I have played like with the concept of traceability in the context of the Zephyr project. And I, I find it actually really useful because you can see immediately what is missing and what's, uh, what you need, what tests you need to add or which requirements are not being covered. But having, I, I have done, or we have done that in the software, in the Zephyr project using existing tools, just, I mean, I don't have an illustration here of that, but I looked at our project, I, we are using uh, Doxygen, and we have test cases, we have requirements, so I used Doxygen because Doxygen scans all the code, I used Doxygen and added like custom, uh, uh, custom commands in Doxygen, and I was able basically to go all the way from requirements to test cases to test results. So there are ways to do that in open source, and there are a few attempts and scripts that you can find across the internet that try to do something like that. But it's, it, it, obviously it, it will not compete with, with a tool that uh, does everything for you, but it is possible. Uh, the, the problem is that it is not being done widely in, in, in open source. Uh, so another thing that some of you probably are familiar with is Misra C, for example. Yeah. So this is, Misra C is, is, is basically a recommendation. It's not a standard, yeah, but I mean, at least you're, uh, the, the standards are, are asking for, uh, you know, following some style guide. And Misra C, uh, although it comes from the automotive industry, the, the A in the Misra C here is automotive, it's, or actually the M, motor, I think, yeah. Uh, uh, it's, uh, it's widely adopted in non-automotive application and you know, depending on your views and how you look at Misra, you, you might actually just hate it, yeah, because it restricts you with what you are doing. And any attempt, actually, just have, have, having been looking at Misra and, 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 you know, looking at what people say uh, about Misra in open source project, it's, it's not, or at least some rules of Misra are not well received. A lot of rules actually make a lot of sense, and you, I, I, I really understand why it is very important to follow some standard, uh, at least to, to, you are not all, I mean, when, when, when more people, when companies and, and users, when more users are using your code, you don't expect them to, to read into your mind, and understand what you have thought when you were writing, writing some certain line of code. Uh, there are different ways to do things, and there are, 
you know there are easy i mean there are uh, there are there is code that is easy to read and immediately understand, and you can write exactly the same code in, in different ways. And the ha following a certain or one guide that is, uh, I would say, it's a de facto standard, uh, helps with uh, uh, you know the, uh, making the code unambiguous and, and easy to read and so on. Obviously, it's also find out. I mean, the way some rules. Uh, are help with with functionality as well. Yeah, it improves not only the, the readability, but it, it can also help with uh, the secure, making the, the code actually more secure. So the the, the challenges the challenges with with Mr. C here is that there are a few rules, as I said before, that are really very controversial. Uh, so we, we really need to figure out a way how to deal with them. Uh, you really, I mean, Misra gives you the flexibility to go and deviate and ignore some rules if you document them. So we really need to decide how we deal with those and which rules we want to deviate from. And we need also to, to incorporate that into the guidelines. Not everybody knows which rules are what. So how do you do that in open source when Misra, the specification or the document, is proprietary. It's not available. You can't just go and browse for that. You have you have to pay 15 pounds or something like that to get the document. So that's that's a showstopper actually from an for an open source project because in the review process, if if you go and tell someone contributing to your code base that yeah this 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 code does not comply with Mesra, some people will tell you what the hell is Mesra and where can I read more about that? Uh, what is the justification? What is the rationale behind it? So that's, that's a challenge for an open source project. I have the document, I mean, a lot of people have the document, but you can't expect everybody to, who's contributing to your project to go and, and, and pay 15 pounds to actually get the, the documentation. So this is, this is a major challenge, and we have, we have to find a solution for this. Uh, also, the, the other thing related to that is we really need to find an open source tool that integrates with uh, our project, which is all publicly available. So how do we integrate that with CI? Uh, so we started the project uh, four years ago or something like that with, like we integrated check batch, like from the Linux kernel. And that's like, we'll integrate it in our CI. If somebody submits something that doesn't comply with check batch, we, you get you know, a minus one automatically from, from CI, and that works really nice. We have a few other things, like for git commits and so on. And we want to add more, and we want to be able to, to give people input or feedback about their code immediately before it's even checked in. And with Mr. C, this is going to be a problem. Right now, for, for scanning Zephyr, we are using um, you know, commercial tools, and mostly we are using that uh, you know, behind fire, behind fire uh, walls and in our uh, companies. So that's not something that we can share. Uh, and one, I mean, trying to do a scan on a full project like Zephyr, that can be a lot because you will get a lot of violations there. So we re you really also need to decide which parts of the code are important to you. Uh, to, to run them through the scanner. And, and also, as I will be talking later, I mean, not only for, for MISRA in the, in the MISRA context, but also for certification. So the scope is also very limited. Uh, uh, the scope is, is very important, sorry. Okay, so just, a, just an example of a rule that is controversial, yeah? It's like a function should have a single point of exit and at the end. Yeah? I mean, this is a lot of you probably are familiar with that. Uh, I mean, based on MISRA, it's like the must read of the structure, less likely of erroneously omitting function exit code. But this is something that you could probably decide to, to deviate from and create a deviation. The main problem is that this is required by many safety standards, as far as I know. So, you know, this is something that, depending on what you are implementing there, you can just go and say, hey, screw that, I'm not going to do this. Yeah, you, you really have to go and Look at your code, and sometimes it's easy to resolve this type of issues. Sometimes it, it, it requires like major changes, and that's that's a problem. So, this is exactly that one of the things that is also mentioned mentioned in the Mistra C, and also, you know, in, in general, is that it, it most of these standards or guidelines 
makes sense if you start from scratch. So basically, when you start developing your project, you apply these rules immediately. Having to do that after the fact is always a problem because it means it means that somebody will have to go and change the code and probably introduce additional issues. And that, I mean, the code is, is working, obviously, right now, so there is no bug. But if you go and start changing the structure, there's a risk there. Okay, next one. So the other thing yeah, is, okay, you can be basically that, you know, a project with lots of features and almost complete and you have a lot all the processes in place and so on the main problem is that you, you you can have the best project out there and the most secure and the most safe project out there that you have built on your own as part of uh, open source community the problem is that nobody will look at that yeah because there's this whole adoption barrier yeah uh, at least for open source projects you know for a company an oem and, and somebody in the industry to go big this leader, they, they expect somebody to be accountable. They, uh, they will not look at hobby projects and, and, you know, and, and, and use them as is. Uh, people are looking for somebody to, to point the finger at. You know? What happens? Who's liable if something goes wrong? Uh, so this is, this is tough for a lot of open source projects. And uh, yeah, even if you have a certified uh, offering, uh, open or even proprietary, yeah, you really need to have an accountable entity behind it. And uh, yeah, and, and it's, it's very difficult to have early adopters, even if you have that, because nobody wants to be the first one to use this. So the first question you usually get is, who else is using that? Yeah, who's, uh, I am going to be the first one, uh, I'm going to be the guinea pig, and, and et cetera, et cetera. So that's, that's a problem that we will face and we are facing on a daily basis. Also, you know, in the context of other, other things, not only uh, functional safety. So how to approach the certification in open source in general? So something that, I mean, you can see, and it seems like the seems to be the consensus here is that if you want to take an open source project and, and drive it through certification, probably the best way to do that is actually to, by snapshotting uh, your source tree, creating a branch, and having basically run it under stricter control, yeah, validating and you know a control and 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 try as much as possible to to separate it from. The, 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 op, the, the, the continuous open source activities and contributions. So basically it's building a cathedral on top or even beside the bazaar. So you, you really have to run two models. Uh, and the other thing is getting the supported feature set right is, is very important. That limits the, the amount of code, the amount of documentation process you have to implement to to get to your final goal. So trying to do, for example, you take download the Linux kernel and say, hey, I'm going to, to certify that, that's going to be a lot of work. So you really have to go and start removing the things that really don't matter. I mean, I heard a lot of you know, numbers that, I mean, somebody was telling me that when it comes to functional safety, every line of code is 150 to $200 in terms of engineering, process, development, certification, validation, etc. Yeah. So every line of code counts in this matter. And 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 yeah, and, and this is this is general basically. It's it's also from a security point of view, it's reducing getting the same functionality with less code, that's always better. Then you, you have less of an exposure and and uh, exposure surface or attack surface. Uh, automate as much as possible. You know, this is as, as related to uh, the traceability. You need to be able to trace everything and you can use commercial tools, but if you can actually manage that within the project using uh, some scripts or some automation tools and, and get all the dots connected, that, that, that would be great. So you have to think about it ahead of time. What tools do you want to use? What interfaces you want to expose to be able to generate the final collateral, you know, for your project. 
And also the, the final one here is try to get a, a, a concept approval at least or some guidance from a certification authority as early as possible. Because you don't want to go all the way and, and, and be told at the end that uh, whatever you are doing doesn't make sense or your plans are not going to work. So you really have to get some con uh, uh, consultation and, and some approval for your concept as early as possible. So the ideal project here is, has a split development model, flexible open source instance, auditable and controlled instance. Uh, the auditable uh, instance is a branch uh, with well-defined scope, developed with stricter rules and with an entity behind it. The flexible open source is you know, business as usual, developed in open with the community participation. Uh, the auditable instance aligns with the open source instance at a cadence that need to be defined based on necessity and, and certification cost. Uh, the entity running the auditable code base has need to have some kind of experience uh, when it comes to certification. Uh, on the other side, the open source community will help enrich the open source instance and uh, basically drive innovation and you know and and keep the, the, your community happy in this case. Yeah. Uh, so basically, when looking at that, I mean. The, the, the whole idea is that, or well, the conclusion is that you, you, you really can't have uh, used the same model as we are accustomed to in open source to, to, to do something like that. You really have to have another track for uh, your functional safety activities. Uh, and that's, that's really important. And I think this is, there are, by the way, I mean, I didn't even go into the standards and what type of software they accept. I mean, there is like, you know, uh, proof uh, by use and there is uh, reusing existing code. And I mean, there is a whole lot of uh, rules and, 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 and documentation about how to deal with something like that. Uh, and uh, that we really need to comply with. But this is, this is the most important part here is that you really have to split the development into two. So an example, regulating the bazaar, yeah. I mean, how, how do you want, you want also your, your open source instance, if you want, you want it to run by certain rules. You can just have the wild west there. So you really want to prepare whatever code goes into the tree in the open source instance has to be regulated to a certain degree so that if you decide to, to you know, to, to sync or rebase, at least uh, like have another version that is certified. You don't want to do the work from scratch. So it's very important to run the project using rules. So, I mean, based on our experiences with the Zephyr project, uh, the code is available publicly and it's very important that it is scrutinized by everyone. Uh, we are using code reviews to you know, improve uh, the quality. And, but the question is, do you have the right set of reviewers? Who, who gets the, to have the final say? How do we guarantee that the reviewer is aware of some safety applica implications? And how long, for example, uh, should uh, changes be reviewed? Yeah. And just, just to give you an example of where things need to be improved, at least on our project, yeah, this is like a snapshot from data we pulled from GitHub project is running on GitHub and shows you how many days it takes to, to merge a pull request. As you can, this is a, a, a logarithmic uh, scale. So a lot of, a lot of our pull requests are merged like three, 4,000 out of 6,000, I think, uh, are merged like within the first day. So this is like mostly trivial stuff and things that have been probably discussed b before the, the, the thing has been submitted. This is, this is good, probably for many projects, but now we are talking on the project, that, I mean, we really need to establish some rules there. Yeah, I mean, it, uh, we re I mean the Zephyr project is developed across the globe. Yeah? And, you know, sometimes I submit something in North America and, you know, and that might touch some area that is under the responsibility of somebody in Europe or China. So it's very important to give people 
uh, uh, more time. So we really need to establish a set of rules of how we want to get things in. So we need to change the curve here and, and, and try to move it, I mean, at least have a few days to get proper reviews. And then also wait for the right people who are responsible for this uh, 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 line of code to actually do the review and not have somebody else who's not responsible. Basically have the code owners review uh, the code. Yeah, so we really need to change that. Another thing is that you, you face an open source project is sometimes you struggle with the fact that not a lot of people like to do reviews. So you see a lot of people submitting a lot of code all the time, but they don't review anything. And the review burden is like left uh, to a few people involved with the project. And this is, this is another problem. Yeah? And we really need to find a way to solve this. Yeah? I, I mean, I still need, we, we, we're thinking about a karma thing. Yeah, where if, you, you know, if you want your stuff to be reviewed, you have to review uh, some other people code. But this is, this is a huge problem. Yeah? So wh for whoever is participating here in, the, in this room, in the Zephyr project, we are, we are asking for, for reviews. Uh, we need more reviewers, reviewers, reviewers. Yeah? Development can happen any time, but we really need reviewers. Yeah? So going back to what I said before about the, the two you know, branches, this is something that has been done in the past. Safe Artos, which is based on Free Artos, was started this way. So there was Free Artos and a few folks, I mean, that's a story I heard, decided that they want to take Free Artos and, and make it uh, usable for, you know, uh, or certify it. Uh, so it was done this way, and now, however, Sep Artos is a commercial uh, application. This is not something we want to do. We want actually to keep whatever we do in the Zephyr context, in the Zephyr project, we want to keep it open source. Uh, so it's, it's, it has been done in the past. So talking about that, having mentioned all of that, where are we with all of this with the Zephyr project? So looking at this, we are like at the very bottom. I mean, we have to admit. I mean, we're not at the very bottom, yeah. But there are 999 steps here, based on some information I got. Uh, so we, we are there. But I think we have the right tools to go up fast. <laughs> yeah. we, we do have the tools and the ingredients to get there fast. Yeah? So it's not going to be one, one step at a time. It's going to be more than that. And that, that's exactly where the Zephyr project comes. Yeah? And that a lot of people are facing this and having to deal with that. So the, 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 the project is to, to run something, com I mean, industry-wide, not, not backed by one single company or by, by one individual. It's actually to run it as a governance, as, as, a, as a Linux Foundation project with participants from across the industry. And in this case, we, we, have, we have the support of Intel, Linaro, Nordic, NXP, and uh, a few other uh, silver members here who are equally basically interested in that and participating in, the, in these efforts. Uh, so the Zephyr project, and this is like the intro uh, at the end of the slide, yeah, the Zephyr project, because I do usually do that at the very beginning, it's, it's fully featured. It's not only about safety. So there's security, and there are a few talks uh, about that. There will also be a discussion on, on Thursday. There's a hackathon running. There will be a, a group discussing safety and security in, in, in general. Zephyr is configurable and modular, and that would help us uh, defining the scope and limiting the scope for certification. So we actually will go to the bare minimum and try to certify, it, certify that cross-platform. Right now, seven, uh, six architectures plus uh, being able to run on Linux as a Linux executable. Obviously, open source under the Linux Foundation uh, with Apache 2 license. And we have a, a very rich uh, uh, IB stack and, and, and Bluetooth stack. So it is, it is uh, fully featured. Uh, this is the architecture here. I mean, very, very abstract, but it shows you, I mean, it's more than just a kernel. Uh, and trying at the same time to solve uh, different use cases. Why Zephyr? The, I mean, the main reason why this actually would work for this problem is that it is, it is 
it is fully open source, it has a governance model, and it's not, it's not, uh, it's not the product of this company or this individual. It is, it is a community effort led by uh, industry, uh, uh, industry uh, names, famous names like NXP, Intel, uh, uh, Nordic, and Linaro. And uh, so we are trying basically to address multiple problems uh, uh, at the same time that we have faced when we started this project, trying to solve the fragmentation. And people will say, okay, you are trying to solve the fragmentation by introducing yet another, yeah. But in this case, if you, if you look at it, it's, it's trying to do things really differently. And when comparing with other projects, we are, we are basically, we have, the, our goals are a little bit different, yeah especially when it comes to, uh, uh, to functional safety. So the features for, for the next year or what we have accomplished, I mean, obviously safety and security are on, uh, on the top priority, uh, but there are a lot of other things going on at the same time. So it's, it's not only about that. We really need to, to address that end to end uh, when it comes to compilers, to IDEs, also to connectivity features. So, I talked about limiting the scope, and that's basically what we are trying to do. We are not trying to certify the whole thing. We are basically uh, going to take a limited set of features that is comparable to commercial offerings, at least. So we can compete in the market and, and certify that. So we are looking at the kernel scheduler and a few kernel services on top of that. And this would also help us because it is the first time we are doing that and it would give us some confidence at least to move to uh, the, the next level and to uh, uh, middleware and application. For example, adding an IB stack or adding Bluetooth, this is going to be significant, but we want to do that uh, as a second step. Uh, in terms of uh, candidate startups, we are looking at, at uh, IEC 61508. Uh, for security, we are looking at common criteria, and there are a few things there, like for other uh, for other industries that we are looking at as well. This is the IEC sixty one five zero eight is is general, and it's like the, the the mother of all other standards, if you want. So, it, uh, getting that would help us also go and look at ISO twenty six twenty six two and 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 others. Yeah. Okay, so Zephyr Long Term Support LTS. This is actually our uh, upcoming release and we are basically going to take LTS and, 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 and fork it, not fork it, branch it uh, uh, and, and maintain it long term and from this branch we will actually create the, the, the mentioned auditable code base which will be taken through certification. The idea is that to keep things in sync and, and contribute back. I mean, this is based on my, our experience with other projects. This is usually very tough, you know, to keep things in sync, especially if you are frozen in time in terms of like the, the code. Uh, but we are talking about a limited set, so that, that should be easier than, you know, maintaining the whole branch uh, for certification at least. So, I mean, just to visualize that here in the architecture, we are, we are looking at, uh, you know, the kernel, some the architecture interfaces, some ABIs on top of, of the kernel, uh, like devices, the peripherals, and, and kernel ABIs, and some portability layers like POSIX and a, a few other things there. So, the summary here is that functionally, functional safety and security requirements need to coexist with the open source nature of the project. So it's not going to be one or the other. It has to be both of them at the same time. Everything open, everything is open source. Uh, quality needs to be driven on the project level. So we need to showcase our quality process and test plans publicly. So we, we really need to start doing more of that publicly to show that we are serious about that. And we are serious about that. Uh, and uh, also drive the adoption through quality managed release process. We, we, I mean, by showing that we care about uh, quality, we want to get more, uh, uh, you know, participation from the industry to drive this effort. Uh, 
Also, we want to manage developer and contributor expectation. I mean, when you are developing in this environment, obviously the expectations are a little bit higher in terms of code quality, in terms of processes that you need to follow. And we will want to continue innovating. We don't want to stall and, and you know, say, OK, we have done enough. Now we are just going to, to work on code style and, and, and fix bugs. We really want to encourage adding you know, new technologies and new ways of doing things. And that's something that we have been doing really well. So we are not really focused in the project on end-to-end -end solution. We are focused, uh, uh, that has its own advantages and disadvantages. So we are more a horizontal thing uh, where a lot, of, a lot of the features, a lot of the value is actually at the, at the, low, uh, at the low levels. If you want an end-to-end -end solution, this is also possible, but you have to do a lot of things on your own. But go, we are going to address that as well. And then we need to also somehow officially establish an accountability and, and trusted uh, entity yeah, to, to deal, for example, something that is in the Zephyr uh, Charter, by the way, is to, to have a certification architect that, and somebody who actually drives the whole thing, somebody with the ex right experience to actually drive the whole process and, and manage it. With that, thank you very much. Yeah. If you have any questions, go ahead. Uh, if you go back two, three slides, uh, you have this architecture diagram. Yes, this one. There seems to be, there seems to be a clear partitioning between uh, the parts or the modules for which you need uh, a, a certificate uh, certifiability and the parts for which you don't need that. So I wonder. Uh, so so you, you talked about the process you want to basically merge back stuff into the certifiable uh, uh, version. Yeah. Uh, have you explored an alternative where in the same tree you split by components and you have the core parts that are certifiable and basically the open source contribute, contributions with a less strict uh, process would be to, only to the parts that are not aimed to be certified? Yeah, I think, I think this should be possible. The, the main problem that right now is Zephyr is like all in one Git tree and we are trying basically to isolate that, to split things. And the idea is not a lot of changes need to be going into the kernel. I mean, you, you, we really need to bring the kernel and the core services to a state where it is, that's exactly what we want. We are just going to fix bugs and, and, and drive the certificate. So we should be able to do that. And the idea is that if we do that, you should always like go and, and take uh, like Bluetooth from upstream, like from master, and make it work on top of it. So it, the, because this, the, the kernel it's on, on its own will be useless if we just maintain that. Yeah? So it's very important to, the interfaces will be supported for a long time and we will be able to take components from the blue side of things and, and make them run. But what, what you are saying there is that this is certainly possible, uh, but we really need to get there first to make this assessment and see if that actually are workable. But that, that's obviously, a a more attractive solution. In this it case. could be even split into two different trees, one for the yeah. orange part and the other one yes. for the blue yes, part. Yes, exactly. And that's what we are trying to do right now. Yeah. Good. Any other questions? Go ahead. No. Uh, you, you talked about uh, first adopters. Do you, do you have anybody and all the, the vendors, the, the supporters of the component vendors, do you have any examples of people who have actually deployed this into real safety critical? Yes, but I can't talk about it. Yeah, I know. I mean, I need, really need to check. But yes, Zephyr was deployed in, in this type of environment already. Yeah, and the expectation is that once we have something, actually, more uh, some of the uh, members of the project will start pushing that into their customers. So Intel and, and a few others will be pushing that into their customers, yeah? Because it, it will be hopefully cheaper, yeah? 
and it's, it's, it's something that you can innovate on. So instead of depending on third party uh, commercial solutions, and, that, and that's, that's the whole expectation, is that this is, this is going to be supported and pushed by the, the various members. But there are, there are already users. Yeah. Okay, so yeah. There are, I understand you yeah. can't yeah. but there's a lease. Yes, yes. Okay. I mean, used in a safety-related product, but we still don't have the certification all the way, yeah? and this is coming. Because you can use it, you know, you can partition your safety model like UM and CEL3 and, 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 you know, depending on, on, on your safety architecture. Yeah, go ahead. Yeah. So you, so you, you certify the lowest level of the safety. Yes, yeah. You certify the lowest level, like power management, interrupt handling, yeah. and you mentioned the unit tests and the integration tests. So, yeah. how hard is it to unit test those things? And could it have been applied to Linux, for example? I don't know about the Linux, but I mean, this is actually the way we are developing. I mean, the unit tests and the testing is actually bare component already. Yeah. So that's already addressed. I'm not sure uh, wh what would be, I mean, the testing is done on a component level. So you are not looking at Zephyr as a complete solution. You look at components most of the time because it's a configurable and modular. So not every application will have the same feature set. So the, most of the testing is actually happening on the component level. So you can already do that. But I mean, some things are more challenging to test than others. Yeah, like there's the all, I mean, obviously, yeah. I mean, there are things that easily tested by just building an application and run it, and you get the data there. But certain, certain use cases would require complex setups, like when you do networking or Bluetooth or, mm -hmm. or multi-core and stuff like that. Yeah. But it's all tested. Yeah, it is tested. Okay, thank you. Any other questions? Yeah. So you are talking about replacing certain commerce with something that is certified or running that on top of something else? Like if you have a hypervisor which is certified, run it on top. Yeah, I mean, that's definitely possible. And that's actually a use case we want to address as well. Yeah. Zephyr already runs on top of Acon, for example. And uh, we are working, we are talking with the Zen project to, to do that as well. Yeah. So it is, it is, yeah, it is definitely possible. It depends on how what your safety architecture and how you, where you, uh, the highest uh, it, uh, integrity level is, is, is going to run. Okay, I guess we are running out of time here. We are leaving. Thank you very much. Yeah. Thank you.